Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Chaipani Restaurant Group. This week on Meet and 3, we're looking at factors that will shape our food world in 2019. We start with trend predictions and how media covers them. A website could theoretically devote all their coverage to these viral trends and, and get all sorts of hits. That's not a way to build sustainable readerships, just as it's not a way to build you know, sustainable restaurants. We report on a big change coming and how street meat will be served. On January 1st, a ban on plastic foam went into effect in New York City. And we round out the episode with a story about using gene editing to create the spicy tomato of the future. At first, it sounds like a, like a gimmick or like something that you would do for fun. The truth is, there is a real value behind it. It's not too late to make your resolution. Subscribe to Meet and 3 wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode this year. This is Lisa Held coming to you live from Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and you're listening to The Farm Report, a Heritage Radio Network show about the people, processes, and policies that shape how food is produced today. Today, my guest is Kimball Musk, the co-founder and executive chairman of three companies that approach food and agriculture from different angles. Square Roots, a vertical farming company that grows food hydroponically in shipping containers, the Kitchen Restaurant Group, and Big Green, a nonprofit that builds learning gardens in classrooms. Kimball, thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, so where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from snowy Boulder, Colorado. Oh, great. So um, that's where um, the original Kitchen Restaurant is. Uh, do you spend most of your time in uh, Boulder? I do, yeah. It's uh, my favorite part of America. I come from South Africa. I'm an immigrant. And I have tried California, I've tried New York, I've driven around the country as far as I could find, and I've settled on Boulder. I've been here about 16 years. Yeah, I, I've actually, I've been to Colorado many times, never to Boulder, though, and I, I hear um, the food there is, is pretty amazing. There's a lot going on, right? It really is. I mean, when I, when I found Boulder, it, it's, you know, it's on the surface as a 100,000-person town, it has the same amount of restaurants per capita as New York City. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's incredible. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> um, so, so as I mentioned, um, you, you know, you've got, in, in addition to the kitchen restaurant group, you've got a lot of different businesses in food and agriculture. Um, and, you know, a, a good place to start, I think, is um, when you talk about what you do, you use the phrase real food a lot. Um, so what do you mean by that? Real food is, is quite simply uh, food that you trust to nourish your body, that you trust to nourish the farmer, and you trust to nourish the planet. It is really the key word there is trust. And in, in the industrial food supply chain, we've lost trust in our system. Mm. Food is really designed to be shipped. 80% uh, of our organic produce is shipped in from around the world. Uh, it, it, it's from places as far away as China. It is just not truly food that you trust compared to understanding our supply chain and creating a new supply chain, working with American farmers, farmers that you do know that you can actually connect with uh, if you wanted to. I mean, not, obviously, as a consumer, you may not do that, but you can trust a restaurant to do that or you can trust a grocery store to do that. And we have incredible farmers locally 
So for me, from my perspective, I, I love local as a powerful proxy for trust. Mm. Uh, organic is also a, a decent proxy, but I still don't, I don't like shipping things from around the world. I think it's not good for the planet. It certainly doesn't help our local farmers. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a little bit of concern around trust when you don't know the country that is coming from. And, and so I, I think that critically the most important thing about real food is just that sort of, in, that sort of gut feeling that you trust the food you're eating. Right. That, that's really interesting. Um, when, when you think about it in the context of local food systems, um, thinking about that, that relationship and the trust um, as kind of a basis for, for all the other kind of um, benefits that are talked about. I mean, do you, do you see that? Um, do you see local food systems as sort of um, a, as a better way to kind of change food as opposed to like, like what you said, organic or other kind of um, solutions that are more global? Um, do you think local is really sort of the best way to go? Well, I think that, that local is a term that has been, uh, that could be used in many ways. Uh, so for our restaurants, for example, we really think about American farmers as farmers that we can connect with and, and you know, meet, meet, meet with regularly. These farmers may be a few hundred miles away or they may even be in another state, but to us, they are farmers that we know. So this concept of know your farmer obviously is a lot easier if, if they are local. Mm. But, but if you want to get salad greens in, in January... You're going to have to go, unless you work with urban farming companies like Square Roots, mm -hmm. you're going to have to go to California or to uh, farmers in a, in, a, in a climate that can grow greens. And that's okay. Uh, so I, I think that local is, is a term that is, is powerful, but it's really the critical element is knowing your farmer. Right, right. Um, so you mentioned Square Roots. Um, let's talk about that. I mean, this is sort of a this huge... Um, business that you started and you know this is the farm report so obviously I want to talk about farming um and right. I <laughs> I actually got to go on a tour of the farm last week here in Brooklyn um, what do you think it was it was so interesting and you know the the craziest thing um was it was this rainy night in New York um and I mean it was po kind of pouring to be honest <laughs> and <laughs> there were 75 people there um that showed up to stand in the rain and see this um shipping container farm and that just kind of blew me away that there was so much interest um in in what it was at night as well right yeah at night too so like in the dark I mean. in the rain um <laughs> and i mean the the one thing that was really cool is the visual you know when you're standing in the dark and and um tobias your co-founder kind of slid open the um, the door of one of the containers and then you see this kind of glow coming from inside um from the lights um it's a really, it's a really arresting kind of visual. Um, so I guess, you know, I got to see it up close, but most people don't. Um, so can you sort of give listeners a sense of what the growing system looks like? Like what, what's the technology that you're using to grow food? Sure. Well, uh, Square Roots was, was sort of born out of this goal of knowing your farmer, trusting your food, bringing it to everywhere in America, you know, even in January to be able to give the freshest, most delicious greens uh, to Brooklyn when it's grown in Brooklyn. I mean, that, that, that really is powerful. And we also wanted to include the farmer in this. We wanted this to be a, about uh, creating a, a, gen, a next generation of, of farmers. So we, we, we came across this approach to growing in shipping containers. And shipping containers are uh, standard in size, but what we do in, inside them is, has been advancing quite considerably. So when we first started, we 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 took a took a shipping container. We had these sort of racks that were that were in there, and we would use a lighting system that was sort of off the shelf kind of lighting system. And we would generate with one farmer, you could generate maybe 25 to 30 pounds a week in in produce, okay. which is about half an acre of outdoor growing if if you if you factor in you know the, the number of seasons. So it's quite a quite a quite a lot of space right. relative to you know one shipping container. But what we've done over the past two years is really started to advance the technology. And, and now, like the technology you, you saw a few weeks ago, uh, is we, we use full spectrum lighting with a few with a few of the uh, of the um, frequencies. Was it the frequency? A few of the, a few of the light bands mm. are removed that that really focus on uh, growing the, the the leaf of the green. So, for example, basil, we remove far red from the from the spectrum. 
far red is a, is a color or a light spectrum that exists when when a when a forest grows over. So in the in the winter time, there are no leaves on the trees, and so you get full spectrum light that hits the ground. And what that does is um, it uh, uh, gives you maximum light to to, to to the ground while the, while the while there are no trees on the on the on the and no leaves on the trees. Right. But as springtime comes and the leaves start to fall over, it creates shadow. And it's still light underneath the tree, but it's a shadow light. And that shadow light causes the stalk to grow and it causes the, the basil to stretch for, for sunlight. Mm. And you actually don't need that indoors. And so we've removed uh, far red from the spectrum. And what that does is it focuses all the light on the leaf of the basil. And as a result, we're now uh, approaching 100 pounds a week per container, which wow. is almost uh, almost three acres of, of outdoor growing uh, space, the equivalent of outdoor, outdoor growing space. Right. So it really has been an extraordinary path to you know, grow delicious, real food in a local community uh, and doing it with, with a farmer. So a farmer will take over one container and manage one container. And as we continue to to, to uh, expand our, our productivity, that farmer actually still does the same amount of work, but their their productivity goes from thirty to fifty to one hundred pounds a week. Right. What is, what is the farmer actually doing in this scenario? Like, what what is their role? So the farmer is that they're doing all the typical things a farmer would do. They're you know growing from seedlings, then they transfer the seedlings into into the towers. They manage the nutrients. They manage the climate. They do the harvesting, uh, they'll do the packaging, and then they'll often even deliver it to the grocery store. Hmm. And I mean, so is, the technology uh, is, is the platform, so the farmer still has to do the work. Right. Well, and I, I mean, I, I asked because, you know, uh, with a lot of these sort of uh, technology um, uh, advanced sort of systems for growing, um, there's been a lot of coverage lately of, of farms that are um, more automated. And I, th- I just saw yesterday that there's like a um, on Ag Funder that there's going to be like the first fully automated um, farm. I think I'm pretty sure it was an indoor one. And so I'm curious in, in your system is, is the farmer in, like in, you sort of keep mentioning the farmer as a really important element is that does that feel like that will always be part of it or is there a sense of like automation is on the horizon uh you know we're 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 huge fans of automation where it makes sense Mm -hmm. but the way we would we would automate would be to empower a farmer to be more more effective and more efficient and more productive um we we don't look at the automation as a critical step, I mean, what we manage very, very carefully is, is energy use. Okay. So energy use and energy cost is, is a very, very high, high cost. But automation has, has not sort of, sh- we, we, just, we just haven't seen it driving the kind of benefit that um, we, we would hope to achieve with, with automation. And I think the other thing is if you take the automation out, you kind of lose the soul of the food. Mm. It's not particularly interesting either. So... Um, w- w- that's not to say we won't do it at some point, or we won't get involved, and we won't find a way to to to, to use it. It's just not it's not in our core thinking. Right, right. And you're also doing like um, a lot of training programs for farmers, correct? Right. Yeah. And so, and are those um, like if a farmer goes through Square Roots tra- training program, um, are those skills transferable to other growing systems, or are they pretty particular to the system that you use? I mean, they're, they're 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 definitely transferable. I think that you're gonna have a very, have a if you if you wanted to grow outdoors on soil, you would have to take a year to kind of get used to that environment. But you would have an extraordinary understanding of farming. Mm. In fact, the, U- the USDA uh, provides a loan to any of the graduates of the Square Roots program. Uh, I believe the number is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars if they do want to start a farm, whether it's soil or indoors. They, they, the USDA believes that what we're doing, what the skills we're teaching them, enable them to qualify for that loan. Wow, that's that's amazing. I mean, that's a, a huge benefit. Young farmers need yeah, it's huge. a lot of help getting exactly. started. <laughs> yeah, um, and so you mentioned um, in, in you, just just now that um, the the energy use is a high cost though that you're trying to manage. Um, and I know, so you know, it's like you're producing so much more food in this small space. And I know um, these your system also uses a lot less water than. 
um, other growing systems like outdoor farming. Um, but the energy use is huge. Um, how does that factor into whether or not this is a sustainable way to farm and, and how do you manage that? Sure. So the energy use can come in multiple forms. So that's one way to look at it. Mm. And the other one is get more getting more efficient with the energy. Right. So the on the first on the first part, if we locate where there are um, where there is excess energy, so for example around hydroelectric areas. So if we in Seattle, that would be pretty straightforward to do that. The other thing that happens with electricity is uh, there's certain times of the day when we have excess electricity. So if you if you talk to a, a an energy plant, they actually run their plant constantly all the time, and so if you if you actually use electricity from 9 p.m. until 7 a.m., mm-hmm. you you you're using electricity that is just being sent into the ground. It is it is electricity that the the the, the, the uh, electricity plants cannot they cannot give it away, huh. and so. As we grow, the, the, the likely path is more along the lines of using energy when it is basically free and available. Okay. And, uh, and so we wouldn't actually use much energy at all from the grid because we can adjust our growing cycle to be any time of the day. So if we want the growing cycle to – if we want daytime to be from 9 p.m. till 7 a.m., that's pretty easy huh. because it is a closed environment. Right. And so there are quite a few ways to, to find ways to use – energy in super efficient ways, um, sorry, to, to use energy that's already out there. And then the, on the, in the efficiency side, you have lighting systems that are just constantly being up, updated and upgraded. So to the, the energy use we have today can, can generate 100 pounds of basil in a week. Two years ago, we could generate 25 pounds of basil with the same amount mm. of energy. So it's just getting better and better. It's just getting better and better. Yeah. And I think, for the, of course, you also have solar energy sources, you have wind energy sources. So it's about being very smart with the energy we use and understanding that we actually have a lot of energy in our system that isn't being used and that can be leveraged really well for indoor farming. Right, right. Um, and, and another thing I, that was interesting to me is um, that at Square Roots in Brooklyn, um, right now you're only growing herbs. Um, is that... Um, is that sort of a first step as well in terms of like you'll eventually grow more crops or uh, I'm curious why um, you chose herbs specifically? Sure. So the, the, the technology platform we built is really defined for premium products. So we, if we were to do uh, romaine lettuce, which is, as you can imagine has a lot of demand right now for in- indoor farming, right. it's still not a premium product. And so the, the farmers wouldn't get much for their work. They would still produce 100 pounds of romaine, but it wouldn't be uh, it, it wouldn't be the same dollar value as basil. So that's it's really about making sure we we, we get we get the credit for for producing the premium product that we're growing, hmm. and that's where it really works in the herb space. That the next steps will be expanding into other lines as we sort of figure out what what is the the best way to expand, um, and. It'll, but it will come from a premium perspective. Over time, our goal is to be able to serve at every price point and at every uh, and, to, and to be in every ge- geography. So, what what will need to change to to make it um, a system that can grow things that are not that premium um, food? I, well, we, we're still we're still doing work on that. Exactly, okay. we're still we're doing work on that. I mean, we'll always be premium, so it'll be a premium version of Romaine. But the truth is you can't charge the same price for basil for romaine as you can for basil. Mm. So what we'll do is we will we'll have most likely a different form factor for the farm. It'll be a farm very much specifically designed for romaine or very much specifically designed for arugula. Mm. It would not be a we wouldn't use a the same the same platform. Okay. Um yeah, I mean that that's interesting. I hadn't because I I'm sort of thinking about, you know, I know when you talk about square roots a lot, it's about sort of providing local food and um, it's, you know, I, I, I think there's like sort of, it's interesting that the, one of the goals is to make sure that the farmers are paid well, right? This premium is allowing um, the price to, to stay um, at a level that everyone is being paid a fair wage. And, but then at the same time, it's like the, the food that's really going to provide calories and nutrients is, is not, is not, you know, a basil, right. It's a romaine. Like that's kind of a funny, um, 
I, I think that at the right time that we will we will get there. Mm-hmm. We just don't believe that the technology is is really well designed for that. Okay. It's it's not to say that it won't. It's we're we're, we're constantly doing R and D around it. We believe the technology is really best suited right now for herbs, and at the right time we will we will expand it to romaine. But when we do that, we'll create a an environment that says, okay, or well, technology platform that says this is really what the farmer has to make. Uh, what is the amount of basil that basil they need to grow? What is the climate that the basil should grow in? That is that is really a perfect climate for romaine. Mm-hmm. What we did with basil was pretty amazing. There's an incredible season of of basil in 2009 from Genoa, in Italy, and we mapped or our, one of our farmers mapped the weather system: what time the sun comes up, what time the sunset, what's the humidity, what's the oxygen, what's the carbon dioxide levels, what days did it rain, mm. and he replicated that season indoors and that's really what's become the premium basil in new york is the square roots basil is the number one basil in in new york and it's because of that approach (laughs) the climate is identical to italy in a a shipping container in brooklyn (laughs) exactly exactly (laughs) yeah that's not not just the weather the, the, the content of the air it is amazing wow and so we can totally control the climate and so we would do something similar with romaine. We would say, okay, let's go look around for the world's best romaine, talk to, talk to chefs around the world that, that can say, you know, we really love this, uh, really understand what the consumer wants, and then then work to figure out a weather system and a climate that, and of, and of course, lighting as well, what they, it's what they call a light recipe, which is a combination of the lighting as well as the, the climate. And what is the perfect light recipe for romaine and then make sure we can grow enough so a farmer can can make a living. Right. And that's how we would build it. Got it. Um, and I, I want to. Um, so so we're going to need to take a break, but um, I think this is a perfect place to to stop because when we come back, I want to talk more about um, use the romaine example um, as a segue into talking about another um, initiative you have going, which is the transparency transparency timeline. Um, so we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Chaipani Restaurant Group. From Bombay to Buncombe and Asheville to Atlanta, Chaipani has extended the love of food, culinary experience, and storytelling to the Southeast. Founded by Meherwani and Mali Irani, Chaipani Restaurant Group includes two locations of Chaipani, plus MG Road Bar & Lounge, Botiwala, Buxton Hall Barbecue, and their new spice company, Spicewala. Learn more about Chaipani and watch their documentary series, Cutting Chai, at chaipanirestaurantgroup.com. That's C-H-A-I-P-A-N-I restaurantgroup.com. Are you enjoying this podcast? Heritage Radio Network has lots more. My name is Carrie Diamond, and I'm the host of Radio Cherry Bomb here on HRN. The show features interviews with the coolest, most creative women in and around the world of food. We've spoken to icons like Ina Garten, Christina Tosi, and Padma Lakshmi, and brought you new voices like Michelle Johnson of The Chocolate Barista and Lisa Ludwinski of Sister Pie. You can find Radio Cherry Bomb wherever you listen to podcasts and on heritageradionetwork.org. All right, we're back. This is Lisa Held. You're listening to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. I've been talking to Kimball Musk, the co-founder of Square Roots, uh, the Kitchen Restaurant Group, and Big Green. And um, so before the break, we we were really talking about basil, right? But then it sort of segued right. into this um, kind of conversation about romaine, and um, which made me think about the fact that uh, lately we've been all sort of hearing about these uh, food contamination issues that um, seem to be popping up a lot more frequently lately. Um, And, you know, one of the things with like the romaine um, scare was that a lot of these issues are hard to contain because the supply chain is long and complicated and we don't know where they originate. Square Roots launched something called the transparency timeline. So um, can you tell me how that, how that works? Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty powerful. 
we we have this in- incredible ability to track everything that is done with our food from the seedling to to harvest to packaging who is involved and it was quite shocking to us when the romaine scare happened and it took them i think i think it was up to 6 weeks to find to find out which farm it came from which is which is just extraordinary yeah in that process we also learned it changes hands several times and the number of days it takes to get Romaine from the time it's harvested to the shelf of a grocery store, not even to your home, but to the shelf of a grocery store, is 11 days. Mm-hmm. And you think about the food waste that can be saved when if you can harvest food the day it's, it's ready, put it on the grocery store shelf, you have another 11 days before it, goes, before it might go bad. So if you, if you take Romaine from a grocery store today, you, you will have maybe two days to use it. But it actually sat for another 11 days. So you have almost two weeks to use it if you could get it fresh. Anyway, we we learned all these things, and we just thought it was really powerful to share our transparency approach and our timeline. This was an internal timeline that we decided to share uh, publicly because we wanted to make sure and and totally understand what's going going on with the food we're growing. And so we decided to share this this, this with with the consumers. So if you walk up to a a, 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 a container of basil or chives or mint, at, at a, a grocery store in Brooklyn with a, with a Square Roots name on it, you, you just put your, put your phone up to it. It'll scan the QR code, and it will take you through every single day of that, of that herb's life, mm. of, the, of the basil's life, from, from this morning when it arrived at the grocery store to earlier this morning where it was harvested, all the way back to you know, a month or two ago when, it, when the seedlings were, were seeded and who was part of that process. And that transparency timeline has just been so well received by consumers to to learn and understand more about their food, to trust their food more, coming back to the powerful role that play, that, that trust plays in this whole process. Right. Well, and it, it's you know I I did get to see it, and it is it's pretty crazy. You can see like each each little step, and um, and it, but it's kind of funny too because in your case the supply chain is really pretty short, and you and you know where things are coming from. Um, and so, you, you know, the consumer is able to see it. Um, but and then in this case, it's like in a weird way, it's it's not so much needed because you're like, oh, yeah, it just came from that shipping container in Brooklyn. <laughs> right. So, exactly, so I, right. Yeah. So my, I think though, the, as, as we as we get more as we sort of grow our production and someone gets their mm. food in, uh, I'm trying to think of a place that we would we would get to. I'm thinking of Newark, for example, or, right. or further away where there's a little bit more to it. That being said, it's it's really the right answer is to have have as little po- steps as possible. I mean, the romaine that, that that we're referring to came from from Southern California, but we get romaine from all over the world. Mm-hmm. It is it is so crazy that we do that, given how much easier it's becoming to grow locally uh, every day. Right. Well, yeah. And what I was what I was going to say is, you know, that technology is the transparency timeline is such a um, seems like such an incredible tool like is it technology that you would potentially um like that other companies could use in agriculture or do you think that other that overall like um other technologies like this will be applied to farming um around the world i think i think the industrial food system really tries to avoid the subject Mm. so i don't think they're going to embrace a transparency timeline because it would scare the daylights out of you if you saw it right so I think really it's about the next generation of farming, uh, indoor farming, uh, farmers that are, are embracing the future where they really do want the consumer to know how long ago it was harvested. But if you're in the industrial food system, this is not information you want to share. Yeah. The industrial food system is, you know, thrives on, on the lack of transparency because if you actually knew what was going on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want the food. Right. And you'd, I mean, the timeline would be so long, you would be like reading a novel. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, it would be crazy. You know? <laughs> um, if they could even do it. I mean, if they could practically even do it, it would be, right. it would be a crazy long timeline. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, well, and, you know, so this is, I mean, the transparency timeline is an example of just like very straightforward application of technology that I, I think no one could argue is like, like it's, it's giving consumers information. It's keeping track of where the food is. And um, I, I think, you know, what's interesting to me is you're someone who kind of straddles these two worlds, um, you know, of tech and food. Um, 
And it, it's, it can be a more like, that's a really clear example, but it can be a pretty sticky space. And I think, um, a lot of the technologies that exist are people don't agree on whether they're good or bad for the environment, for human health. Um, and I'm just curious, like from a big picture perspective, what do you, what do you see as technology's role in building a more sustainable food system? And, and I guess even, maybe even more importantly, how do we distinguish between good and bad technologies while continuing to innovate? Yeah, I think if we focus on the, on the, on the goal, which is real food that we trust, mm-hmm. I think technology can be used really powerfully. I think the, the, when you remove the farmer from, from the equation or you remove transparency from the equation, I think that's when technology becomes way less interesting. Mm. The, uh, the, if we end up with, with food that doesn't really taste very good or technology that enables us to ship food for longer, that doesn't rock my world. But if it's, if it's technology that makes the food taste better, that enables us to use less uh, pesticides, you know, indoor farming uses almost nothing. But, but ideally we want to use, we, we do want to use absolutely nothing. And um, the, all of these technology improvements do enable us to create food that tastes better and we trust more. And I think that's when I, I get really excited about technology. Mm. When you say um, tastes better, what do you mean by that? I mean, the, the basil that we grow in New York, it just tastes much better than any other basil out there. I mean, it's grown with a very, very uh, a, a beautiful climate that, that we know creates a delicious basil out there, but it is also not shipped. So it doesn't have any, any um, uh, you know, basil will have a lot of spotting when it comes in from, from far away. Mm-hmm. We just don't have any of that. It is, it is beautifully clean, delicious basil. And when you take it home, it'll last another five or 10 days in your home. So it's, it just tastes better because it's fresh, and it's also grown in a in a climate controlled environment where it is absolutely the most delicious basil you've ever had. Right. I mean, the it, it's interesting that you can sort of get the perfect conditions um, in that closed environment. <laughs> like, right. like a lot of farmers are probably the climate control is, is so powerful. It really is amazing where you can grow the same basil over and over again and make it you know obviously refine it each time to make it a little bit better. But uh, it is you don't have all of the force majeure of, of other of nature. So right. you have you've replicated nature, but it's but it's absolutely perfect every time. Right, right. Well, and but and so the flip side of that is a lot of people would argue that like you, you know, maybe you're stripping something out because you don't have sort of the fluctuations of nature. And um, I think like the the best example of that argument is soil. Right. So there's a there's some people don't like the idea of growing without soil. Um, others are super passionate about hydroponics. Um, and you know, I guess in my mind, like the, the taste, um, question isn't, I mean, I think taste is really important because people will, will eat things that taste good and we need them to eat healthy things and things that are good for the planet. But, um, but I'm more interested in, in soil in terms of, um, you know, its ability to sequester carbon and, um, we sort of, everyone sort of agrees soil is depleted, right? All over the, the world and that right. it's really hard to grow in. Um, but there's like th- this idea that we should be regenerating the soil so that it can sequester carbon. And then there's systems like square roots that are saying like, well, if the soil is depleted, we'll just grow inside. Um, but I- I'm curious what you think, like what's the role of soil to you in building a more sustainable food system? Is it what we need to do both or is it, you know, I'm just I think curious. it really is about doing both. Mm. It's, we're not at all anti-soil. Our restaurants, uh, we source almost 100% from soil-based farmers. Mm. We love working with them. What what we don't like to do is have it shipped in from around the world because in January, on a snowy day in Boulder in February, we 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 have to do that. Yeah, uh, we would much prefer to have square roots, you know, locally, and we would we would have locally grown greens that 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 taste great every time. The 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 soil the soil soil farmers really do have play a, a wonderful role. I would like that. I'd like the, the the land to be used for more nutritious foods. The, most of our soil-based farming is corn and soybean, right? And it's not it's not good for the environment. It's certainly not good for for, for people because it's it's really just it's a meat. It's it's, it's for animals, animal feed, and ethanol. Forty percent of our of our corn-based land, which I think is twenty five million acres of land, twice the size of the California Central Valley, is used to grow ethanol. Oh my God! Which, which at its best, is a neutral uh, uh, 
uh, in other words, you take one gallon of oil to create one gallon of ethanol. Right. So most of our farming in soil has really, really been terrible for the environment. Mm-hmm. If we, if we, as we move things more towards growing fresh food locally, it'll, it'll do more carbon sequestering. It'll grow food that is better for you. That, that I love, and I've, we're huge supporters of that. Uh, in addition to that, urban farming is going to play a great role because 11 months out of the year, we really do have a superior product. Mm-hmm. For that one month in June when basil truly is perfect coming out of the soil, I, I actually think it's truly is great. It's great to, to have a local farmer mm-hmm. give you basil uh, from soil. But for the other 11 months, it's, it really is better indoors. Right. Um, and so right now, Square Roots is just in Brooklyn. Is that right? It's just in Brooklyn. Yeah. So, so tell me, um, what's the future? Like, what will what will this look like ten years from now? Yeah, we're working hard on that to to grow our what we call campuses. So, what you visited was a was a, a normal campus. We're working on on different parts around the country where we will service communities, and we'll we'll have exciting developments to announce over the next few months. But our goal is really to bring real food to everyone. So, we want to start at premium premium products, and as we as the technology matures start moving into more uh, salad greens or salad-oriented greens. But eventually we'll go all the way to blooming vegetables like strawberries and peppers, eggplant, really whatever we think will, will resonate with the consumer and works with, uh, as, with the technology. Mm. Are there particular locations that this model works better in? Like, um, like a reason you started in New York City and, and as you expand, like are you looking at particular kinds of cities? Well, we'd love New York City because... That's a city where demand is just not the issue. So if you right. <laughs> have a good product, there's plenty of demand. And so we like that, and that was a good way to test out the technology platform. And as we get it to you know, the quality and price that, make, that makes sense for our customer, we'll be able to sort of really analyze, you know, what are the next communities we should be going into. Okay. How about Boulder? Uh, I'd, I'd love to do one <laughs> in Boulder. Probably not too far away. Yeah. Well, I was surprised that you that you didn't start there since, um, you know, your restaurant is there and, and everything. But I guess New York just uh, like you said, the demand is so much is so high. Right. There's just so many of us. It's here. a great place to do it. And, and people from around the country are flocking to join Square Roots as a farmer or as, as an engineer. And New York is just one of those places where it's a great place to attract talent. Right. Right. Um, all right. Well, I think um, I think we need to wrap up. Thank you so much, Kimball, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you all so much Bye. for listening to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe to the podcast, rate, and share it. I'll see you next Wednesday when we'll be talking about hemp. Thank you for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to learn more about our 10-year anniversary celebration happening all year long, subscribe to our newsletter. Just enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. You can connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food.